Hello and welcome back to part two of the Ottoman Sultans. I'm joined here once again with Jem Tiduku, who is the writer of The Sultans, The Rise and Fall of the Ottoman Rulers in the World. And just briefly recapture how do you come across the Ottoman Sultans? So, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, to pull the curtain behind the making of, usually when people say this is part two, it means that everybody went for a cup of coffee and then got yeah. on with it again. But we're genuinely on a separate day. Yeah. So uh, it, it's it's good to be back. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, the in answer, uh, yeah, to, in summary, uh, the name Jem Duduchu is obviously that's not English. Uh, my father is Turkish. Turkey was part of the Ottoman Empire. So I grew up with the stories about the... The, the Ottoman Empire, and I then ended up doing a degree in archaeology and medieval history. I got involved in things like the cru later Crusaders movements, which brought in the Ottomans, and I ended up writing a book about it because I, it was almost like, as I said in the previous uh, uh, episode, it was almost like, okay, these are the stories I was told. Now let's look at the actual facts that happened in history. And sometimes they matched up, but on lots of occasions they didn't. Mm. Um, we thought we ended the episode with Mehmed II. We started from Osman the first, and we ended with Mehmed the second. And we don't continue a wee bit on Mehmed the second before moving on to the next Sultan. We don't to end with another Mehmed, the Vadatin, Mehmed the sixth, and we discussed how they <laughs> how in the Ottomans in the last episode that there's really were quite few Osmans, but there's. Some Mehmed sats we will see there are six of them, and there's some Murads as well Murad, as Salims yeah. Yeah. in there. But as we shall see later, but it's that's something that I found fascinating, and that there's so few Osmans, and there is one that we will take a look at later, I think. Okay. Well, I mean, this is the thing. So we did in this is two parter. In part one, we did a quarter of the. Ottoman Empire. So we now have to do the other three quarters in this one. So I guess <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to move on fairly, uh, fairly quickly. So yes. um, I, I think a good place. So yes, we, we did 1453. We've Stop. got... We, yes, we, we've got uh, Mehmet II, Mehmet Fatih, as he's known um, in the uh, Islamic world, which means Mehmet the Conqueror. Um, but obviously, yeah. Yeah, so obviously, the other thing I fascinating about Mehmed is that, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but okay. he, he, he you'd think that with the capture of Constantinople, he kind of I'm good, I'm going to sit here for a while, but he doesn't, does he? He kind of moves no. on to the next conquest, and then there's the next conquest again. Indeed, and also sort of like one of his enemies is, is perhaps one, one of the more famous enemies of the Ottoman Empire that's gone into popular consciousness, Vlad the Impaler. Transylvania is a part of modern day Romania. That's a genuine place in the, in the past. Um, and no, he wasn't a vampire, but he did do lots of horrific crimes like uh, staking people alive. Um, and, and so, look, we, again, Sounds we kind like of a lovely have... fellow. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime um, and tough on the causes of Ottomans, too. Uh, but if you like, the whole point of the Ottoman Empire, like any empire, is growth. And in the first 50 years, because it started so small, it's almost like nobody really noticed the growth in the first 50 years. But after the mid 1300s onwards, it just gets this momentum. And so 1453, while it is important in so many different ways, listen to the first episode if you if you want to know more about that it as you said it was by no means the end the point is an emperor a sultan of the ottoman empire needs to keep growing and expanding and so he was pushing into the the balkan regions uh to, you know solidifying ottoman control over serbia and romania mo modern day uh countries obviously so something um, that we should add as well to the list is that yeah. it kind of saw itself it didn't saw this as been discussed that this was the, was this the end of the romans at the last episode <laughs> but so but that Mehmed kind of looked while well, it wasn't legitimate in european eyes it kind of looked at himself as the continuation of the Roman Empire after the conquest of Constantinople. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And and indeed, um, a, a little bit later on, when we talk about one of the other most uh, important or well-known Ottoman sultans, Suleiman, I was planning to read out all his titles because we talk, call these people Ottoman sultans, and that's what they were. But yeah. that was not the way they necessarily saw themselves. So, yeah, I've got a nice long list to show you the mindset of what these <laughs> rulers thought of. But certainly, if they've conquered Constantinople, they've inherited the Roman titles. If the guy you've just beaten was a 
the Roman emperor, well, that makes me a Roman emperor, doesn't it? Um, it's just that the title really had kind of fallen into disuse in, in the West. And so you did have a, a holy Roman emperor, but it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't really much of an empire. So nobody kind of believed that. But any of the Western uh, rulers would be aware of the heritage of the, of the Roman civilization, but the Ottoman sultans could genuinely say they were sitting literally top capi palace. It was a rebuild, a restructure of the old imperial palace in Constantinople, which had been the epicenter of the Roman civilization from the 300s onwards. So it was, it was the new Rome and that's exactly what the Ottomans uh, considered it. The other thing worth mentioning is of course, it is now called Istanbul. Uh, and I not, think a lot not of really think officially, though until 1923 but that's exactly. another story yeah 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 so i mean so just, just sort of like to clarify if you spoke to mehmet ii uh, after uh, 10 years let's say the year is 1463 and you say so what is this city he would still call it constantinople in all official documentation it was called constantinople there's a whole story in the book about theories about how the name changed over time but the point is it again, it again, they were tying into this Roman Western civilization. They weren't trying to be this other Eastern Islamic empire, but that's the way they were portrayed by Western powers. Mm. So you thought you started about how does it because it's quite a brutal and bloody battle when, when against Vladislav, isn't it? When when it yeah. comes comes to the, the, the Romanian frontier. Yeah, so I mean, the the the, the reason why Vlad is uh, it, it, well, Vlad Dracul uh, Dracula is because his father got a, a title. He was uh, he was a member of this order. Like, there's the Order of the Garter in England, and in the height of like the medieval era, there are all these chivalric orders, and one of them was the the or Knights of the Dragon. Basically, this was a Hungarian title, and so. Because he was a good Christian man, he was called his his title was Dracul, and his son was called Dracula, which means son of the dragon. Which even when you translate it, it's even cooler than just Dracula. So uh, yeah, he the reason why he was so bloody is he was up against an empire and he had less of everything. So what he needed to do in in modern terms is carry out almost insurgency warfare, guerrilla warfare carry out these uh, acts of horrific violence to scare. And indeed, there is a one situation where Mehmet's army marches into this area where it's just a forest of staked human yeah. beings. And they basically look at this scene of utter torture and insanity and just go, right, we're coming back again. We're going back again. That's the official story. I think there's probably also an element of he was probably destroying crops and things like that, sort of like a, you know, a burnt uh, earth policy. And so, uh, yeah, ba basically he, he sounds insane. Um, I think he probably was a little, went a little too far, but he was trying to do anything to stop the Ottomans. It is worth pointing out. This is a man who ended up being kicked out of his own power base twice yeah, he came back a total of three times to be the ruler. Um, and they he did say third time a is a charm. Yeah, third time's a charm, except for Vlad, who ends up being uh, killed and having his head cut off at the end of a battle. Um, so, but he, you know, he did fight. He was a thorn in the side of the Ottomans, um, you know, for, for, for years. Uh, there was a very clever time. He could speak um, uh, Ottoman Turkish as well. So he could sort of like sometimes trick garrisons into handing themselves over. It, it, was, a, it was a very interesting time. That's another, but, something I want to on. ask you about is when you mentioned this, that this spoke Ottoman Turkish, which was in the last episode and you don't really have to watch it if you want if you but i highly recommend you do to get that insight on how the rise of the ottomans happened but you talked about how there is no turkish nation until turkey but you said yeah the language itself did does was that kind of similar to what we have today the language would you recognize would you be able to understand a turkish person i don't just to simplify would you be able, well, able it, to understand the Turkish it, it, yes and from no. that er, era yeah, so so the the answer is yes and no in the sense that the the language absolutely existed and is similar. I mean, it's a bit like uh, Shakespeare and modern day English. So it would would be hard on the ears, but you could get most of the words. But the critical thing is, in the time of the Ottomans, they used 
the Islamic calendar and they used Arabic uh, lettering. So what happened in the 1920s is Turkish went from Arabic writing to Latin alphabet. And actually the modern Turkish is completely phonetic. There is sort of like, if you know how each letter is pronounced, there are no exceptions. It's very easy to, to read a Turkish newspaper if you understand the rules. But it, it did mean there was a whole generation of Turks who became illiterate again. They were used to writing in the Arabic script and that all went away. So it means that a uh, modern Turk finds it very hard to read the chronicles of the time of, let's say, Mehmet II, because it's, first of all, you have to get it into a completely different alphabet. The other thing is that because the dating changed as well. So my grandparents were born at the very end of the Ottoman Empire. So their birth dates on their um, on their tombs, uh, you know, on their, you know, on the gravestones, their birth date is in the Islamic calendar, but their deaths are in the Christian Georgian calendar. And that means it looks like they lived for about 700 years because uh, the Islamic calendar uh, sort of like sets itself from the time that the Prophet Muhammad I'm sure that didn't, uh... left. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, they were old to me as a little kid, but I'm pretty sure they weren't 700. Also, the other thing is the whole gr <laughs> the whole grave. Um, it, when, when we went to the cemetery, there were hundreds of people who seemed to be living for like 750 years. It was it was so weird for, uh, you know, if you don't yeah. know what was going on. And as a child, I didn't know what was going on. And I sort of found this amazing. So, yeah, back to Mahmoud again. Does How does it, you see he's still on the stage, he returns? What What's next? So I, I think the best thing to do uh, is to go to his death, actually. So once again, we have uh, a sultan who ruled for about 20 years, but he dies in his 40s very suddenly. This actually and like we, says, discussed, like we discussed in the last episode, this was kind of normal for Ottoman sultans to die in, in that age, right? There were three of them in the row that sort of like died in their 40s. And when, as, as from natural causes, we don't know why. But actually, they just landed an Ottoman force in, uh, in Italy, uh, on the Italian peninsula, and because of all the uh, military successes, everybody knew that it was going to go for Rome. And it, and there were there are chronicles of the time where people going, oh, you know, I went to Rome to see it just before it fell to the Muslims. It, everyone just assumed Rome would be conquered. But because Mehmet died at exactly the wrong slash right time, depending on your point of view, the Ottomans left uh, Italy um, and and they could have taken Rome, but they had they had to go back. And what happens next is we get a civil war again. This is another example of how this is why the sultans had a habit of killing their brothers because if you don't, there, it it was not the young the, the oldest automatically becomes sultan. It was basically who gets to Istanbul first or it, it, who gets to Constantinople first. And in this case, there were two brothers. I know, I know you just did have to have the Janissaries on your side as well. They were always favorable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the Janissaries the became more of a political power later on. But you're quite right. As things developed, uh, and, and indeed, you know, we there's the situation with Selim the Third. But we're talking many, many years later, where basically he. Um, that's an example of a sultan who was was actually forced to uh, retire because of the pressure from the Janissaries. But the Janissaries always backed one of the sons as well. They weren't mm. trying to sort of uh, carry out a, like a, a coup to mm. put in a Janissary general as, as the And as we shall see this again when we reach Salim, the dream, which is quite a fascinating story. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, so, so what we've got at the end of uh, at the death of, of Mehmet as the conqueror is you've got Bayezid, who would uh, in theory be Bayezid the second, and you've got Jem, and I, that's who I'm named after, Prince Jem, and uh, Jem in Ottoman and modern day Turkish culture is a bit like Robin Hood. He's a real person. Um, but he sort of goes on these adventures, but I don't like him very much because he had two chances to beat Bayezid in battle. Mm. He fails both times and basically he spends the rest of his life living in luxury, being yeah. brave, going on adventures, 
But uh, he won't be abandoned know... as for Bison's Ex second death. Exactly, exactly. He was held basically as a form of hostage in the West. And any time Bayezid was threatening a certain area that perhaps the Pope didn't want him to threaten, they would always say, well, we could send Jem back on the head of a crusade. And Bayezid mm. would pay huge amounts of money each year to keep Jem in luxury, but also away from the empire. So um, there, but, so... Something I want to draw back to, because I don't remember the second we draw to back to Bayezid again in, in a second. But this is kind of a similar case to Mehmed's uncle, who also had a legitimate claim to the throne, right? He was kept in, we forgot to mention this in the last episode, but he was also kept as a prisoner in the Byzantine yes. Constantinople, and it was kind of pain in the ass to Mehmed, because he <laughs> they were threatened to release him and cross the civil war in the Ottoman Empire, right? Absolutely. So again, you can see it's a very brutal logic, but if I kill all my brothers, that means they're not going to attack me or they're not going to get angry and go to Venice or, or somewhere else. Uh, and so if I'm the only one in charge and I'm going to have lots of kids mm. myself, but it, it, it means that the family continues but I don't have that threat to my power base. This does happen, obviously, in pretty much every other country in, in the world. You know, a member of the family tries their luck at some point. If you're a weak ruler, somebody else might have a go at it. Um, but the Ottomans recognize this uh, as a genuine threat and did their best to eradicate that threat brutally. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, sometimes small children being murdered on the accession of the next ruler. Um, it's absolutely terrible when that, when that happened. Uh, and obviously, so, you know, you're a harem girl. You want your son to become the next sultan. So these women, it was, people think that the harem was like a pleasure palace. I mean, yes, the sultan did have, you know, intercourse with his his concubines. But at the peak of it, you would have 300 concubines. Some of these girls simply never met the sultan because he was too busy with, the, you know, his top 10 favorites. But these women would do anything to make sure, I mean, you, nobody wants their child to be murdered. So these women were playing just as hard a political game behind the scenes as the men were, as the politics were, because if you get it right, your son becomes the next Sultan. And then your status as the mother of the Sultan will increase massively as well. Um, so, so yeah, so that's what's going on behind the scenes. And so that's what the thing that uh, Mehmet had to juggle with, Bayezid had to juggle with, Selim had to, you know, all these Sultans are aware that there's this scheming uh, going on at this time. The Bayezid's rule seems to be kind of stable though. It seems to be kind of decent yep. rule to me. Once he'd got Jem out the way, uh, he sort of lived up to his forefather's uh, name, you know, Bayezid Yildirim. He, and, and, and pretty much every single one of these sultans, up until we get to about the 1660s, is, is expansion, expansion, expansion. They don't necessarily win every battle, but they are constantly expanding this empire. And critically, under Bayezid, very later on in his, uh, his, his reign, it's got nothing to do with Bayezid, but we get these uh, brothers... Um, we think that they were probably Albanian, but they are pirates and they are the most um, effective pirates in history, uh, arguably, because they that would be up... Barbarossa, right? I, yes, yeah. exactly. Not the Holy Barbarossa. Roman Emperor, but a different Barbarossa. Yes, I mean, literally red beards. So, I mean, obviously, uh, if they were of Arab stock, they were unlikely to have red beards. Um, but we actually, the interesting thing about Barbarossa is he actually has, uh, he's two people. He's two brothers. The first one gets killed and the second brother picks up his name. And they end up conquering, you know, how on earth did the Ottoman Empire end up ruling North Africa? And the answer is, well, the Ottoman Empire never went there. But these pirates became so successful at plundering and capturing, they basically, they took the whole of North Africa for themselves and realized they had no idea how to run a state. So they basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but they basically went to Bayezid and went, well, obviously we conquered it all for you. Mm. We get to be the governors. We get all the we get all the girls and we get all the money and we get all the grapes and the wine, but you get all the tax revenues and you, but you need to put in an actual administration and garrisons and things like that. Sounds and good so, to me. Yeah, so, so yeah, Bayezid expands, but he probably doubles the actual size of the empire without doing anything. These pirates do it. And indeed, um, Barbarossa, he's, um, you know, he actually retires and he writes a book and he's... He loses his he, arms, doesn't he? 
he, well, the first the first brother does, and he gets mm. the name Silver Arm. He gets it replaced with a prosthetic silver arm. I mean, that that's as piratey as it gets. You know, he didn't have a hook; he had a whole mm. silver. Only missing missing is the arg. Yeah, yeah, no arguing. Uh, no tricorn hats. They were wearing turbans because they were Muslims. Um, uh, but he was so good. The, the second brother, who had both arms, he was so good that basically the French king went to him with ambassadors and said, we will give you anything you want to become the admiral of the French navy. And he turned them down. But in other words, if you can't beat them, join them. And everyone just admitted that there's no way to beat this guy. So everybody was very happy when he retired. And when he wrote his book about naval warfare, it was trans translated into every language in Europe because you want to hear what it, it would be like Ronaldo telling people how to play football. You're going to read that book. This guy knows what he's talking about. Um, so yeah, not every pirate was in the Caribbean. They didn't all die, uh, you know, have their be executed by the Royal Navy. Uh, you know, some of the, you know, the really good pirates were the ones who actually started working with governments and became more fabulously wealthy than they could ever possibly more be. More or less what we would later call privateers, right? Uh, yeah, pr well, privateers on steroids, because, you know, yeah. they, they actually setting up their own state as well is just ridiculous. So that's happening in Bayezid's reign. Um, and, and Something that we of, should add as well on. is that the, as you know, in the is Islamic world, you have to go to Mecca to, you know, the Hajj. But no sultan really does that. But Jem, is, who was exiled, would technically be the only sultan prince to, of the Ottoman dynasty to actually do this. And I feel like we should mention this as well, that he would be the only one to actually do the harsh, the pilgrimage to Mecca, right? Yeah, so when people talk about the Islamic, power, uh, Islamic empire, that's true. But yeah, as you say, one of the things that every good Muslim is meant to do in their life is take the pilgrimage to Mecca, if you can afford it, if you are healthy enough. But if you can't afford it as an as an emperor, uh, when can you afford it? So every single one of these men should have, as part of their Islamic duties, taken the pilgrimage to Mecca. None of them did, except for one that had fought a civil war and lost. I get the feeling he did it because he had nothing else to do, but that's mm. that's pure conjecture. Um, but it is interesting. It's, when people say, well, how serious Muslim were they? How hell-bent were they on converting uh, the Muslims, uh, people to Islam? The answer is, well, not very. The other thing is that in the mm. empire, if you weren't Muslim, you basically had to pay a tax. And therefore, Christians and Jews and uh, other faiths as well generated money for the Ottomans. Um, and, and they did, and, and I guess this is a point where you know, when we start talking about, well, you know, they, there's conversion of some of these slaves and things like that. And are oh, they taxing you know, the Jews? Oh, this is terrible. Look at what was happening in the rest of yeah, Europe. Yeah. Bayezid the second is also I mean, he accident. I mean, he did his own campaigns, but he accidentally did very well from these pirates. Yes. But also in 1492, we get Ferdinand and Isabella conquering the last Islamic state in Spain. And in the in the late 1400s and into the early 1500s, they start kicking out all the Muslim scholars and all the Jewish families. Mm. And, you know, where do these Jews go? And they've been sort of shunned from places like England. There have been massacres in like the Rhineland in the past. Where do they go? So they went to the Ottoman Empire because they saw it as a mm. safe haven. The Galata Tower built by, uh, you, know, you know, built by the Genoese, um, uh, it actually was temporarily turned into a synagogue. Mm. Um, so, you know, and Bayezid is on the record saying that the Ferdinand is meant to be this wise monarch. How can this be when he enriches my and land? And this is where we get into people. the famous Inquisition as well, where you... Yes. And in the end, you had to pay... So, you well, you argue that you had to pay tax, surely. But compared to Europe, you had religious toleration in a sense and we talked about this in a Ref reformation in the ottoman empire episode as well what is but what is toleration at the time what it, it wasn't the same as we think of it today but you still had somewhat toleration for you had were allowed to practice your religion even though you weren't muslim and in the in Absolutely. the early in the early umayyad caliphates as well you see that they are actually resenting converting because that's how they get the taxes right that they didn't yes, want, really yes. want to convert them because this is money for us we can profit from this yes so so the, the point is you know 
if we're going to put the Ottoman Empire in the modern world, this is a group of people that would allow you to practice whatever faith you had, um, that would give you safe passage, um, you know, a, a tolerated different languages, different religions, um, different uh, ethnicities. That's pretty forward thinking. Now, I don't want to overdo it. As I again, I said, slaves, warfare, uh, expansionism, all these things don't play well to the modern ear. But it does lead to uh, one of the things I start off with my book is talk about how the Ottoman Empire, it lasted for over 600 years. Mm. It's the largest Islamic empire in history. You know, it, it had it covered uh, thousands of square kilometers in Europe and on into the Middle East. Mm. And yet it's like a forgotten empire. Uh, yeah. Most countries. Uh, so this summer, I went to um, I went to Crete, uh, you know, the uh, large uh, large Greek island in the Aegean, and um, you know they talked about uh, World War II because that happened there. They, it was invaded by German paratroopers, um, but they did talk briefly about the Ottomans. But it was always bad things. Mm. They would talk about the Minoan civilization and Knossos, which is amazing, by the way. Um, and they would talk about ancient Greece. Um, but then as soon as it got to the Ottomans, apparently the only thing the Ottomans did was kill people. And it's like, mm. well, if that's true, why was there anybody left for the uh, for the Germans to invade in the 1940s? Yeah. So, you know, it's one of these things. It's it's been remembered by Greece that everything the Ottoman Empire did was bad. And it's just simply not true. Yeah. Uh, when you when you look at the height and we're getting into sort of like the peak of the Ottoman administration, it's hard to find anybody who's actually Turkish in, in Constantinople working for the government. Most of them are going to be Greek or Serbian or Albanian. And these people are earning or retired very good money, for example. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. They're earning good money. They're actually helping to administrate these places. Um, uh, you know, it's it's. It couldn't have been just, uh, you know, massacres for 400 years in Greece because then there wouldn't be anybody alive today there. So clearly, it, you know, there was actually a working system there which worked well. And, you know, the Greek Orthodox Church was not eradicated. They still were able to to um, You still uh, have Mount to, Athos to in Greece today. And they didn't eradicate Mount Athos when they took over Greece Exactly. Yes. So, so um, you know, it, it, we obviously buys it eventually passes away, and we then get to um, we then get to Suleiman the Magnificent, which so, is sorry, one of these Salim names. first. Salim. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. There is. But, there but is, we don't yes. have to talk too much about him because we didn't make an episode last year, which I highly recommend checking out with Alan Mikhail. We made an, made an episode on how he changed, trying to change the modern world in a sense, and he, it's a really fascinating episode and his book. On Salim the First is absolutely fabulous. I highly recommend reading it as well. But something we should mention with Salim is that he was third in line, I believe. Yeah, he was hey. not the favorite to, to be in. Ahmed was basically uh, Bayezid's favorite. Um, but um, as Bayezid was getting old, and he's now, he actually makes it to his 60s, so that's really old for an Ottoman uh, sultan at that time. Um, Basically, the the son started thinking, "Oh, maybe we should start making a move on the uh, on the empire." And Selim basically played it the best. He also was the one who got the Janissaries on his side. So again, we're seeing the importance of J the Janissaries playing politics and not just fighting. Um, so yeah, so S Selim played the long game. He shouldn't have won, but he did win. Which he did shows have Kurds on the sides as well, if I remember correctly, which were absolutely were, which yes. were favorable to people at the time. Yes, yeah, so the, the but they realized the that he could use them as a, to his advantage. Yes, so the the, the Kurdish area, uh, Kurdistan, as some people call it today, although it it's it, the, the Kurds are the I think believe they are the largest ethnic group to have to not have their own nation. Uh, Kurd, modern day, which is Kurdistan, a terrible shame, to be honest. I think. It, it is, but at the same time, where do you fit it? Because mm. Iraq, Iran, and and uh, yeah. Syria and Turkey aren't just going to give up chunks of their land. We don't but really want is... another Israel situation again, do we? It it gets yeah, but the th but the thing is, so today, 
uh, you have the Kurds fighting a low level insurgency in eastern modern day Turkey and the Kurds and Turks do not get on well. But the irony was that once the Kurdish people were incorporated into the Ottoman Empire, they were the most loyal, hard fighting soldiers up to and including World War One. So, yes, you've got the Kurd, you, so you, you mentioned the Kurds in reference to Selim in the 1500s, mm. and yet they're still fighting in the 1900s. So actually, mm. there's, if you like, no greater ally to the Ottoman ideas and military ex expeditions than the, than the Kurds. And yet today, if you ask a Turk what you think of the Kurds, they go, oh, you know, they're, they're the bad guys in the East. And it's like, it's so much more complicated than that. Exactly. And just briefly, because we, and we go into, again, we go into more detail with our Al Mikhail in our episode from last year, but he does win the civil war and he sends his father away. He actually is the first sultan, future, future sultan, to, sell, to, to abolish his father, isn't he? And it, there is, has been theorized that he had, did kind of kill him when he was leaving Istanbul or Constantinople, if you will. What do you yeah, think so, so Bayezid this? is, well, yeah, I think the way Selim would have said it is my father is retiring, although he was forced to retire and he does die on the route to where he was going to be settled. So it's highly likely. We just don't know. But it's it seems that it's highly likely that it he does got murdered. sounds like him, though. It does sounds like something he would do. Exactly. And we're not, you know, we're talking about a bunch of people who are willing to murder children to be to secure their throne. Why would they not murder an old man? Mm. So, you know, this shows you the very harsh, you know, we talk about Game of Thrones and how it's based on things like the War of the Roses in, in England. It's sort of like that is amateur hour compared to what's going on with the Ottomans. Mm. And of course, what does it do next? Because it is quite the, the expansionist. And I read a while, a few weeks ago, at month, I think Eugene Rodin's book, and he opens with Selim the Grimm's conquest on of the Mamluks, and something we haven't talked about the, until this point again because we mentioned caliphates before, but if if you know a wee bit of Islamic history, you know that basic for calling yourself a caliphate is that you have to have Mecca and Medina, the whole two holy places, right and. The Ottoman Empire doesn't have this at this point, but when Salim conquers like, the Mamluks in the 1700s, that's kind of when they officially can. He's the first Sultan to call himself a caliph, right? Yes. So, the, you know, we've been talking about things like, you know, the conquest of Constantinople and pushing off it, pushing on into the Balkans. But the Ottoman Empire, you know, spread throughout the whole of the Middle East. When did that happen? Selim was absolutely at the forefront of this. And, uh, you know, there's this, there's this, there was this worry that when Selim died, it's sort of like he was, again, such a warlord, such a great war leader. It's like, you know, is his son, whoever it's going to be, going to sort of stand up to that scrutiny? Is he going to achieve the same great victories? It, we now know that with uh, the first Suleiman, so, you know, we are now 200 years into the Ottoman Empire and we've got yet another new name popping up uh, as Suleiman. There had been Prince Suleiman's in the past, but there'd never been a sultan called Suleiman up until this point. And he is known in the West as Suleiman the Magnificent. Mm. And in the East, he's known as Suleiman the Lawgiver. Yeah, he has quite those... a lot of names. Yes. Apart from that as well, doesn't it? Loneliness. Well, those are the uh, those are the unofficial titles. And I'll, I'll, I'll come up with, I'll, I'll read out the full title list in a moment. But those titles imply that he wasn't as militaristic. And the reality is he was. Um, he, he absolutely was. You know, so he 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 becomes Sultan in 1520. Um, and um, within by 1522, the island of Rhodes, which had been again a thorn in the side, it had been the site of this. I believe you wrote that that he had lost two battles in his entire career, doesn't he? Yes, yes, that, that's absolutely true. Um and uh, the, the, the first siege of Vienna. Um, and that was because it was the rainiest summer in on record, and basically he couldn't get his heavy cannons up to the uh, up to the uh, walls. And the other one was the uh, Great Siege of Malta, uh, which is an amazing story in and of itself. We won't have time to go into all the details. So something there. I find fascinating, I would like to add, is how the weather is such significance in history to play out the way destiny, to put it for the lack of a better word, has affected the battle. Like you have Napoleon and. The, 
the Germans in Russia when the winter kicked in and they were those little bastards had the cold winter there. And you got Selim the Grim, sorry, Solomon with the cannons in Vienna because of the dirt roads and it's been raining. And you got Caesar again when he was invading Britain in 44, that's not 44 BC. See, but it's, you know when he was invading Britain and how yes. this stopped all these powers from expanding. It's fascinating to me how the weather has been such a significant case for victory and for the fate of the, the Europe that or the world basically. Yeah, look, I, just as a, a brief aside on this, I I absolutely agree. There's a, there's an excellent um, play that's been turned into a movie. Um, which is all about the weather report for D-Day and how actually whether you can land on D-Day or not, because they needed the right conditions to land troops on the beaches and to drop paratroopers behind enemy lines. And basically it was down to this British uh, off a naval officer who had to work out the weather forecast and he got it right. It looked like it should, it, you know, it was going to rain and it was going to be a washout. So that gives you another example of how important weather can be. But the other thing that's important in just any kind of uh, campaigning is logistics. Um, and uh, if you want to look at Ukraine right now, one of the reasons why the Russians are having such a terrible, terrible time is they are appalling with their logistics. Um, and so the Ottoman Empire was... You mean renowned. special military operation? Uh, yes, special military operation. Yes. I don't want to get into trouble here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but the Ottomans were renowned for their good logistics. They would literally take ovens with them to bake bread for the troops. When uh, this, at the second siege of Vienna, this is where I'm fast forwarding to the 1680s, um, uh, when they set up camp, the, the people in Vienna actually initially thought that they were just setting up a rival city right next door and going to perhaps trade them mm. into submission. That's how regimented and beautifully designed uh, the um, or the, the tents were, the layout, the discipline. And when you compare that with a sort of late medieval European army where they're always dying of cholera and, you know, they're sort of like uh, they're, they're defecating where they're eating. And it's just like the, the basic hygiene rules of the Ottoman Empire uh, and the Ottoman army and the Janissaries was just was just streets ahead of anything in the West. So they understood that while it's very exciting to talk about battles and perhaps, you know, the greatest victory of Suleiman is Mohax in 1526, which basically brings Hungary under the influence of the Ottoman Empire. Um, you know, it's very exciting to talk about the battles and cavalry charges and cannonades and things like that. If you can't get the equipment or if your men are already sick from like uh, cholera, you're going to lose the battle. So yeah. weather and logistics are the most important thing in any kind of military campaigning. But on yeah, you're quite right. On that one occasion, Suleiman got caught out. But allow me to read out all his titles. Please do. So, here we go. Sultan of the Ottomans, Allah's deputy on earth, Lord of the Lords of this world, possessor of men's necks, king of believers and unbelievers, king of kings, emperor of the east and the west, majestic Caesar, emperor of the Chakans of the great authority, prince and lord of the most happy constellation, seal of victory, refuge of all the people in the whole entire world, the shadow of the almighty dispensing quiet on the earth. Now that is a title. Imagine if you would put, put, put uh, all his titles every after every <laughs> name, and then <laughs> they would be quite thick. Your book. Oh, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. But then, but you got sort of like Emperor of the East and West. Yeah. So the, um, and and majestic Caesar. Specific references back to the to the uh, Roman something era. That we should, that. Something that we should mention as well is that the map of the Ottomans is quite huge. To put in Trump's favorite word. It's it is on the border of Vienna. Basically, they have Hungary. It's not yet Austria. The Habsburgs aren't yet, as they will be after the second siege of Vienna, as we talked about. Yes, but they aren't yet Austria. Hungary. They are because the Hungary is at this point under Ottoman territory, and the half of North Africa and the Middle East is basically. We talked about this in the episode again with Alan Michael that the Ottomans would be the closest recreation of the Roman Empire since the Roman Empire at this point, because there's if you looked at the map, it kind of makes sense that they Yeah, it's 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 bigger than the Eastern Roman Empire and they even go further sort of like northeast. Um mm -hmm. not yet, but when we get to uh I'm gonna say the 1660s with Mehmet the Fourth, 
at that point, so, I mean, you know, people talk about Suleiman the Magnificent being the, the peak of the Ottoman Empire, and we're talking about, mm. let's say, the 1550s, okay? Although he, he ruled from 1520 to 1566, but let's, let's say 1550. But, in the, but into the 1650s, the Ottoman Empire is still expanding. So I think the, the reason is that with Suleiman, you've got the peak of the organization. And immediately after Suleiman, we've got uh, Selim the Drunkard, Selim the um, Second. But, but it shows you how good the system is, that if you've got a drunk uh, sultan who basically accidentally kills himself by slipping on a, on a wet uh, marble floor and smashing his head in, um, you know, if he's that drunk and that useless, then the empire should crumble. But actually, he had by then... Uh, we had really good uh, the grand viziers. We talked about this in the first um, in, in the first episode about how they're like um, prime ministers. Uh, they're basically, the prime ministers of the Ottoman um, Empire. So you got Sokolu uh, Pasha. He was the grand vizier of Selim II, and he was more than capable of running the the uh, the um, empire in Selim's name, if you like. So something we so, should add, add as well. You you said that vizier was kind of the equivalent of. Of prime minister, but what, yep. what did the title of pasha mean? Because that comes up quite a lot in when you read generally, generally it's Ottoman a, history. What is the title of pasha? It's not the last it, name because the Ottomans didn't have really have last names, did they? No, they, no, they. Oh, okay. So actually, I can tell you. Uh, I'll I'll tell you that now. So. Uh, yeah, you're quite right. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, people did not have surnames. Okay, so my surname is Daduchu, um, which is unusual because it's actually a title from the Ottoman court. It basically means the keeper of the uh, Sultan's birds of prey. So you know how they would stand there with like a hawk on their hand mm. and things like that. Somebody had to look after all those hawks and falcons. That was clearly my family's job. 500 years ago okay nice to know we earned a living so but that's unusual because uh, in the 1920s i mentioned how the alphabet changed to west basically there's the founder of modern day republic of turkey was this guy called mustafa kemal we'll get back to him later of course yeah ataturk um but he wanted to westernize he wanted to throw away the ottoman empire and move the country to look to the west not to the east and so he told everybody they had to have a surname. You know, you have a family name in, in Europe, so you've got to have a family name in Turkey. So once you know that, every single person in Turkey's surname is something cool, okay? You will never get, you know, uh, Jem the Idiot. You know, there's no surname that is embarrassing. If you translate them, they're all things like Lion or The Best or, you know, Awesome or Flag Bearer, Standard Bearer. They're all incredible. Every single surname is awesome in, in the modern day Republic of Turkey. So that's, so yeah, so um, so Pasha is, is like a title. It's kind of hard to translate because there isn't an exact example of that in the West. But if you think of kind of like Prince, governor it is absolutely a sign of respect it's a sign of authority and so uh, you know if if uh, um you know if i'm gem pasha if you call me that it's a sign that you know you absolutely respect me and that i obviously have some kind of power in the society around me for example that's something that we should add as well and we will talk briefly about this in our episode because you i'm gonna have Jean road in that who wrote the history of the arab on uh, pretty soon as Excellent. well, and we in his book he write that as a man after the Egyptian conquest and the conquest of the Middle East by the Ottomans, that you think that it's trying to go downhill, but it's he argues in his book that there is actually a more of a golden age in the Middle East under the Ottomans as well. Well, yeah. So to, to not get too heavy here, if you look at the Middle East for the whole of the twentieth century and into the twenty first century. It's it's bad. OK, mm. there are massacres, there's violence, there's wars, etc. It was run by the Ottomans for centuries. And I'm not saying it was perfect, but it was um, it was a lot calmer. There weren't all these wars. There wasn't all this internecine warfare and, and sort of terrorism attacks and things like that. And, and the Jews absolutely lived side by side with the Muslims and there wasn't warfare or bitterness going on there. So if, if the Ottoman Empire could do better than the United Nations, that's something we need to give it credit for, which it absolutely gets no credit for whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. And let's go on to Murad the third. I believe that he is the one who has second siege of Vienna, right? That's what he's known for. So, um, uh, I, it's, uh, or am I too I, early I, I, now? I, 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 we, 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 so we, we sort of, um, for everybody else, we're sort of like jumping forwards here. 
Um, I just I, no, I feel yeah. the, obliged to talk a, a little bit about the the women as well because Suleiman yeah. really impressive Sultan, but actually his wife he actually marries for the first time in hundreds of years. We actually have an Ottoman Sultan marrying one of the women of the harem, and he marries this woman called Roxolana, and she is seen, you know, she is second only to Suleiman. She has this. In, she's incredibly important. She sort of power plays her children. She has to beat. Suleiman was uh, didn't fall in love with her first. He'd fallen for another woman, so she had to try and catch his eye, and sort of like get his attention and push the other woman to one side. And the other woman had already given birth to a boy, so it was down to uh, Roxolana to give birth to a boy, which she does. But also sort of like convince Suleiman that the other boy from the other mar well, not marriage for the other woman, he's definitely going to try and overthrow you. And so we, you know. It's shown as a love story, but it is just as vicious again as Game of Thrones. You know, people are dying from her actions, but she's also a woman that she's is basically sort of like, a Cersei, in other words. Yeah, a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. But at the same time, this is also a woman who is opening poor houses and bath houses for the poor as well. So she is very much trying to improve the situation. Now, fast forwarding a couple of generations, and we've got another woman called Kosem, and she was. Um, basically, uh, she became the, the wife of, of one of the sultans. She became the mother of, she was the mother of a sultan. Uh, and she was also the, um, uh, basically the regent of Ibrahim, the mad. Uh, that's no, so he, he didn't last very long. He, he was trotted he was out. The mad, it kind of makes sense yeah, that it didn't He was last. absolutely crazy. And then they put him back, uh, back away again. Um, so this woman played the game for decades and uh, just like Roxolana, you know, she she was in some way. Well, in the case of Kosem, she was genuinely more powerful than the sultans because she was the one choosing who would next be sultan and move them so, around accordingly. Something that I would like to add, though, is that's where we talked about how they, they had to kill their brother. Sunman was kind of. An exception because he was the only son of Selim the first, so he was didn't have to bother doing that, did he? No, yes. Yeah, so, so that was a highly unusual situation, and uh, but he certainly caught up with the number of sons. the 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 Ottoman uh, Sultanate did not die out or anything like that. But yeah, so so that that was an unusual thing. That was a quirk. There's nothing that we could do about that. He was the last. He wasn't the only son. Um, but he was the uh, he was the only one that made it to adulthood. I think we, that's an important sort of difference that we need to say there. So he did um, save this trouble by he didn't have to kill his own brothers. Exactly. Yes. So so uh, if we're now moving into uh, like the sort of it, it, we, so we're, we were in with the with Suleiman. We're in the 1500s. We're now into the 1600s, and I think there's sort of like two important points we need to make here about uh, Mehmet the Fourth. Um, so he was Sultan in the 1660s. So one of the things he did is he captured uh, Crete, which is what I just mentioned earlier, where I went on holiday. But he also finished the conquest of the lands around the Black Sea. So uh, when when you mentioned earlier about how the Ottomans sort of like continued their expansion yeah. and actually, you know, how far did they go? The Crimea, which is in the news today, used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. And it had the Crimean Tatars, which were a Turkic group like the Mongols living there on the Crimea. They didn't they have a Khan being... as well before the Russians they did. came. They, they were forcibly removed by Joseph Stalin. I, I believe some of them came back again. I've got no idea what how many there are today in Crimea. But the point is, you've got the whole of the Black Sea where every bit of land around it is ruled by the Ottoman Empire. And so that's completely dominating the trade there. The important thing about Constantinople is it is on this sort of like bottleneck between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. It's so important, so crucial, uh, even today. You just can't beat geography like the weather. Um, mm. And so even though we're now thinking, oh, the, 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 uh, the empire's on decline, and indeed it's under Mehmet IV that we get the second siege of Vienna, which is a very something I would like to thing. add. That I'm sorry for interrupting you again, That's okay. but but I was reading. Uh, I believe it was the Medici's by Paul Stratton a while ago, and he mentions that, and it makes sense because after the conquest of Constantinople, the, the, the Venetians traded with the Byzantines and stuff, right? But they kind of banned trade on the Ottomans, but because they felt like if we trade with them, we can't help the enemy, and they are, they will 
we finance the wars against ourselves. And this is what we see with Russia today as well, right? It makes sense that we can ban, ban trade against the Russians because they are very much the enemy. We help them finance the wars against the, the against us and that's what they saw with the ottomans as well right that the west can't stop trading Absolutely. not necessarily believe, stop I, but well, you know they kind of officially stopped it was well to, to back you up on that i believe there was a total of seven um ottoman venetian wars and actually that you you led me in very nicely because on one of these wars uh, is something that was really important for both of them so uh the siege of candia the if you've never heard of the siege of candy it's really important in history because it's the longest continuous siege in history now i'm going to just pause it for a moment maybe you want to pause the podcast and think about how long can you actually siege a place okay uh, you know there's the trojan wars that they're meant to last 10 years and stuff like that there was the 900 days of leningrad how long can you possibly siege a place pause now write it down and i will tell you the answer and that is 21 years so for 21 if years, Bursa was a long time. Yeah, so Candia is on Crete. Uh, uh, it's the capital city of Crete. Um, it's now called Heraklion. Uh, and so from 1648 to 1669, this went on for so long that it was one of the things where, obviously, if you were a good power, you should do this quickly. You should either defeat the attackers quickly or you should be able to break in quickly. So in a way, it was a sign that both empires weren't as good as they used to be. But it, because it had ground on for so long and the whole of the of Europe wanted to know who was gonna win this, that neither side could afford to lose it. In the end, the Ottomans did win, um, but it did take them 21 years to get in there. But at that point, everybody kind of thinks that, yeah, that's probably a sign that the, you know, the Venetian, Venice is definitely a dead empire, but the Ottomans aren't what they used to be either. And round about the same time, we get the second siege of Vienna, which again was close, but the Ottomans do ultimately lose. So, and the, Andrew know, Westcroft Mehmet... wrote a brilliant book called Enemy at the Gate, which yes, uh, that is, is just, brilliant. just about this, this siege. Yes. So, but, but what I would say is that, that people sort of say, OK, so so it's under Mehmet IV. Mehmet IV had to start off his his uh, actual um, uh, sultanship uh, going around areas trying to reinforce Ottoman rule. It was beginning to all get a bit loose, but he did a great job of building it together. He did conquer other places and he did try and get um, Venice, uh, sorry, not, uh, Vienna, but, but failed. And it is worth remembering, look on a map, how far west in Europe is Vienna? That's the sort of like the... The, the breaking tide of the Ottoman Empire twice. Um, so, but when people sort of say, well, this was kind of the beginning of the end, it is worth sort of fast forwarding a hundred years. So if we go from the 17, so from the 1660s to the, sorry, 1683 was actually the siege of Vienna, the second siege of Vienna. So if we go from 1683 to 1783, fast forward a hundred years, the Ottomans, haven't lost that much. The main thing they've lost is Hungary, but Hungary was never really 100% under their control. It was just too far away and it was too close to the West. And, and so it wasn't, if you were looking at the Ottoman Empire in 1783 and went go, is this going to collapse any minute now? Nobody would agree with you. And it is worth remembering that it's going to continue into the 1920s. So mm. it, it's, it's, you know, it's surprisingly robust. When we, when you, you know, you mentioned the sick man of Europe and in the 1800s, that's when the Ottoman Empire started yeah. getting that reputation of being the sick man of Europe. But it still had a lot more going for it at the end of its lifetime than the Byzantine Empire, which really only had one city by the end of it. So... Uh, I don't so quite the, know like we talked about in the last um, in the in the episode with Richard Crowley as well. The Byzantines at that point were re pretty much the sick man of Europe at the time of forty fifty three before the Ottomans were. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but then uh, I think another person sort of like talking about a little bit later that doesn't sort of get a lot of conversation is Selim the Third. Mm. So um, basically, he, we're we're talking about the time when. Really unusually, we got a complete a person that we don't think about going into the fighting the Ottoman Empire suddenly arrives, and that's Napoleon. Yeah, uh, because he arrives in Egypt, which is technically part of the Ottoman Empire. It's sort of semi-independent by then in seven, you know, within the seventeen nineties. Some, actually, now. I wanted to interrupt you there again. Go for we it. have to we have to mention some um, very 
infamous enemy of the Ottomans that starts to get power at that point. Be, a, be a little bit before Napoleon. Sure, Napoleon. Oh yes, yes. Now we're talking about, talking about, the, about the Russians. Russians. Yes, yes, of course, because they kind of started getting pain in the ass for the Russians under Peter the Great. And I read a while ago his Peter Robert Kane Massey's book, the late Robert Kane Massey's book on Peter the Great, and they, they do did seem to tolerate each other earlier. Early, before, before Peter the Great, but then they kind of see that the Peter the Great wanted to a naval power, and they didn't have a naval bay, and but the Crimea and the Black Sea would be the perfect base for. So that's this is kind of where they start to become bitter enemies, right? Exactly. So when if if we're talking about the decline of the Ottoman Empire, a lot of Europeans say that there were bad sultans and some of them were i mean i mentioned selim the second who sort of fell over drunk and killed himself and you know uh, there's murad the fourth who um had of the liver and also his mother kosem tried to turn him gay and he was just a very crazy man who ended up executing one of my ancestors as well who was by then an ottoman general uh, but i mean he executed his own brothers so i'm not gonna i guess i can't you know fair enough yeah um so, you know, there were some, sort of, but the thing about Murad IV is I've just talked about how wild and crazy he was, but at the same time, he recaptured Baghdad and he was the last Ottoman Sultan to actually fight in battles. And he was a really big guy as well. Um, so, you know, it, it wasn't as simple as that. The reality was that the Ottoman Empire suffered two things that nobody can change. The first one was it was being attacked on three different fronts. We keep talking about the West, and that's true. So you've got places like, you know, Hungary and the Holy Roman Empire and places like that fighting uh, the Ottomans. But then suddenly in the north, we got this rising power of Russia that's just growing and growing. And it's growing at the expense of the Ottoman uh, territories around the Black Sea. And then in the east, you've had the Persians, which, you know, they've they've been around since the time of the Romans. Um, and whereas they're perhaps the least threat, the problem is that if if you sent all your armies north to fight the new expanding Russian Empire, and then any army comes in from Ira modern day Iran into Iraq, which was then part of the Ottoman Empire, you don't have any soldiers around to try and stop that. So trying to fight three different powers simultaneously. It's hard. It's you, really you can't, hard. You can't do that. So that's problem number one. So every empire ends up sort of reaching its peak, and that's problem number one. But the problem number two was something that a problem that didn't exist for like the Romans or the ancient Greeks or the Mongols, and that's nationalism. And that so nationalism is the cancer of any empire. Now, obviously, I am talking to a proud Norwegian, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what is the day of Norwegian independence? Seventeenth May, of course. There we go. Yeah, I, I know a number of Norwegians there. There, there is of. a there is a running joke that we have in in Norway where we say, "How many countries have seventeenth of May?" I mean, just in Norway, because you know we think of the national independence or independence day, and, and but in real reality, it's you know you know never no the punchline there, but yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. of a running joke that we think just Norway have seventeenth May, so that's the quickest answer to that joke. Absolutely. So yeah, so I um, so of course, you know, and I know because we've had talked about this offline, that if Russia is the problem. Then, then the Ottoman Empire needs to find somebody to help them. And that would be the Swedish Empire, which, of course, right. at that point, Norway was part of. But the thing is, in, let's say, 1600, the no, idea... Actually, of... actually, Norway was part of them, Denmark, Norway oh, at the time. It wouldn't be before 1814 that we would become a Swedish province. Yeah. Ah, uh, OK. So, so but not so Sweden and expert... Finland was a thing. Sweden and Finland they had put several... In the Baltic area of the European mainland, at the, at the point, they had several provinces in the European mainland as well. See, this is what, yeah, so I need, I need to be told this stuff. So I was aware <laughs> of the Swedish Empire, and the Swedish Empire, for its, for its size and also population, was, was relatively small, but they were incredibly well-trained troops, and they, had a, they did a great job of fighting Russia, which is obviously much larger, bigger you population. They actually beat Peter the Great at some point as well. They did indeed, yes. Um, and, and so you had... So the great news from the point of view of the Ottomans is that the Ottoman Empire was never going to be a rival to the Swedish Empire. They were never going to meet. There's just too much land between them. So they could, weirdly, Sweden and... It sounds like uh, an unlikely alliance. 
Exactly. Well, I mean, in the uh, in the 1500s, you actually had an alliance between uh, Suleiman the Magnificent um, and uh, and and also Selim and uh, Queen Elizabeth I of England. Again, too much. Were they allied them. with the France as, as well at some point? There right? was there was a brief period of time with yes. Yeah, so, I mean, there's all these different alliances. Basically, it did. You know. I mean, using uh, you, you, going back to Sweden again, yeah, they got completely different cultures, completely different religions, but they had a common enemy. So mm. you know, if if we the enemy of my enemy is is, you know. is my friend, absolutely. So if the Ottomans were busy fighting the Persians, um, then at least we could we could keep maybe the Swedes could keep the Russians busy while we're doing that. So there's these very intricate deals going on but the nationalism so everybody today is very proud of their country but if you go back 500 years nobody kind of knew what a country was because the communication wasn't broad enough so yeah. i'm in london i would have been a proud londoner before i was ever a proud englishman 500 years ago i mean i was aware that there was this place called england but i didn't know where the borders were they you know nobody had up-to-date maps and you know you would probably spend most of your entire life in a 20 mile radio radius around your local you didn't home. travel to new york for holiday yeah. shop, weekend shopping or go to Istanbul exactly. to exactly. see the Hagia Sophia right but once we get the idea of nationalism starting to to creep into something like the Ottoman Empire, it covers so many different modern day countries with, again, as I said, so many different languages and religions. But suddenly the otherness of, well, the, the most famous one to break away first was, of course, Greece. You know, gr I Greece. Mean, they have 200 years today as independence. Is that is that? Correct, we mentioned this in the Ottoman Reformation episode. I believe it's something about 200 years now. 200 years since, uh, since probably since the start of the of the uh, uh, Greek um, War of Independence. That yeah. sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing is, though, that when Greece became independent, in inverted commas, at the end of the Greek War of Independence, it was about, I'm going to say, about 35% of modern day Greece. I mean, places like the, the second largest city in Greece is Thessaloniki, and that was still Ottoman into the 1900s. Um, so, you know, it wasn't complete. Um, it needed an awful lot of intervention from the West. It is also worth pointing out that in the middle of this war of independence with uh, uh, an empire, they ended up having a civil war, arguing over who was actually going to run the country afterwards. Uh, you know, it was a whole mess. Of course, whenever you have your own independence movement, it is mythologized you're the good guys the other people are the bad guys mm. we never did anything wrong everybody was instantly happy the moment we became independent none of these things are ever true when you look into uh, the history of these things if you want me to get sort of like move away from ottomans for a moment it's worth remembering that one of the first things that happened in america after they became independent is they had a huge recession followed by a a, a brief insurrection people died in this called the whiskey tax revolt so, the, so, you know, it wasn't all uh, a land of milk and honey just because you don't have an imperial overlord, because now you have to run things yourself and you can't blame well, you the, have other, to do that the other guy. You have to do it yourself. So this was the problem. And, and there's just no empire can solve the problem of nationalism. If this group of people don't want you and there are other countries willing to give them weapons and supplies and things like that, you're probably going to lose control of Absolutely, them. Absolutely, yeah. So th this is this was the unsolvable problem that the, I do believe the that Ottoman Muhammad Empire Ali had. at the time in Egypt did help the Ottomans yes. in, during the independence streets, if I remember correctly. That, that, that's absolutely right. Um, and but the thing was that the Ottoman uh, Sultan uh, basically declared jihad, which once you cl declared jihad, you can't back down. But then in the end, they did actually come up with a peace term, which put Muhammad Ali. Uh, so basically, he was the ruler of Egypt. It was one of these things where technically he owed allegiance to uh, to the Ottomans, but in reality he was his own ruler. Simple yeah. as that. And he was able to get to power because of the mess that the because we mentioned this earlier when Napoleon came to Egypt. That was the point where everybody realized the Ottomans just can't 
Mm. They don't have the control to look after Egypt. It was the British that came to Egypt and, and helped kick out, but also the local population kicked them out. At no point did the Ottomans send an army that successfully managed to get rid of mm. uh, the, the, the French invaders. It is This is also a very weird period in, in Napoleon's his story where he stays in the Middle East and he starts fighting further and further up the uh, sort of eastern Mediterranean coast. Um, it was talked about him actually going to Turkey, to, to Istanbul as well. You write about this in your book that he was yes. going to go to Istanbul and actually help train, but it never happened. He trained yes. the Ottoman army. He was thinking about, he was an artillery officer by career, and he wanted, I mean, as I said, 1453, the Ottomans are famous for their artillery, but by the 1790s, not, not so much. And so, you know, the idea early on in his career is maybe I go to the Ottoman Empire and, be, you know, treat, teach them how uh, uh, um, artillery to practice and, and to targeting and things like that never quite happened. But, but he does end up going to the Ottoman Empire technically to try and conquer it. Um, so, yeah, that was a complete dead end for, for Napoleon. Oh, yeah. It led to multiple failures, but it caused such turmoil in the area. He caused such disruption that it allowed people like Muhammad Ali uh, later on to, to sort of like forge his own independence. And and so and the that would be, the, his dynasty gone. would be way up until 1953, until the Egyptian revolution. NASA, Nasser, yeah, yeah. Ab uh, yeah ab absolutely. So, the, yeah, the thing is that really the 1800s is uh, you're now just talking about one disaster after another, mm -hmm. where the Ottomans are having to retreat and having to sort of like uh, compromise. And we've got the great powers starting to pick away a bit. We got the Crimean War in the 1850s, where basically uh, uh, France and Britain um, are desperate to try and prop up the Ottoman Empire because they're worried that if the if the Russians push too hard, the whole thing's going to collapse. Um, so that's really that that's really why you got all these weird, weirdly different allied countries fighting over something that people don't even understand. Mm. Uh, that, you know, so that we again probably don't have time to go into the whole of the Crimean War now, but it it, it was I wish, it was, <laughs> yeah, it it was sort of like a, one of the last gasps gasps of the Ottoman Empire, um, and then sort of like this leads us hurtling towards the bitter end game of you know World War One. Before uh, you, the, yeah, go on. There is some, yeah, well, we I'm have to not mention, quite sure. What you, go on. We have there is a moment the second. We have to mention him briefly, I and mean, we did talk about him more in detail with, with Virginia Aksan. I highly recommend checking out that episode. But we have to talk about him because he does at at this point something haven't we haven't again mentioned in a while is the Janissaries as well because at this point they are quite powerful and they are corrupt yes. and they aren't really a working force. And it has been argued that they were kind of stopping not the expansionists, but they were stopping. Well, I, I, I don't have the word progress. in my progress. Yes, that's the word. They were stopping progress in the empire, getting better because they felt like they should be the one in power, and they basically were at this point, right? But one minute, second. Yeah, I, I, I want to put a little, you know, just sort of like bring that in a little yeah. bit. They, they thought that they knew what was best. They didn't want to actually be in power themselves. Again, they were always going to have one of the Osman family members yeah. to be the ruler, but they're going to be a puppet yeah. uh, to the Janissaries. And you're you're quite right. What you get with Mahmoud II is uh, you get these... Uh, this I feel like it's uh, absolutely worth mentioning because he's... Yeah, you're, no, you're right, you're right. So when did the Janissaries end? They end when they just overstep their power. They, they've been, they have been more of a political liability than a military success for now a, about a century. They're outmoded... European armies are now way ahead of what the Janissaries are. They cause more trouble than they're worth. So that's the point where they get disbanded, mm. uh, which causes great upset. This is the end of a very long period of, of society. Obviously, they, they it is a bloodbath. It is a bloodbath within this. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to go the quietly. Janissaries. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, but but we now get the formation of what we would now recognize as a more modern European army. But they don't come in with peace and love. They come in with bayonets and rifles mm. firing. So, yeah, there, there is absolutely a bloodbath. You you know, no, people always cling on to power, don't they? Uh, so mm. but but so you do get this change. So the 18th century, so 1800s, I should say, 
is this so the janissaries are probably the best example so thank you for for sort of bringing that oh, up yeah no, no worries. but they you know they they're starting to build railroads uh, you know to help with the mm. pilgrimage to mecca and you know they they leave top capi palace and they build dolmabachi palace on the other side which of the which is a hugely popular choice the way i would it massively expensive utterly pointless it has at the time the world's largest crystal chandelier it also has what's known as the glass staircase because is, why not a, yeah yeah it's, they it is an unnecessary expense but what the interesting thing about dolmabachi is it looks european everything now they 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 recognize they've got to change they've got to adapt they start you know the grand vizier is a title that still exists, but we're now getting more of an, a government around them, a parliament uh, almost around them. And so we're, we're starting to see the rise of what becomes known as the Young Turks, but initially the movement is known as the Young Ottomans. And it's it's about the and, and the argument that the Sultan starts using... So, something I do want to ask you before God. moving to that, though, is would you say that the Ottoman army after the settlement of the Janissaries would be kind of irrelevant at this point after the Janissaries because it seems to go downhill like you said with the army the well they're trying I mean there are multiple we talk, we talked about the Greek War of Independence but the, but Greece tries to expand its territories sometimes they win sometimes they lose so it hmm. does show you that the Ottoman army and indeed by the time we get to the Crimean War there are no Janissaries there it's the Ottoman army and the hmm. Ottoman army did actually do uh, acquitted itself adequately it was not the best army there that was the French um, but they weren't a disaster which if they'd still had the Janissaries by the 1850s it no doubt that it would have been an absolute disaster Briefly going back to the language, the Crimean War also shows you the limitations of this of, of Ottoman Turkish, where it's so flowery, it's so flor florid. If you ever read any Orhan Pamuk, he quite often writes in this almost impenetrable metaphorical way. He is impersonating Ottoman Turkish literature, uh, which is impossible. Um, to show you how, how complicated it got, you had guys at the front line writing in the Crimean War how horrible the conditions were, how terrible the trenches were. But the people at home were reading it like the same letter, but just reading it as going, oh, he's saying he's having a great time. Well, if you mean one thing and people are taking it in another way, that's showing you that the language doesn't work anymore. So this everything is beginning to fall to pieces. And the, the sultans are trying to fix it, but fundamentally they need to fix themselves and they're not willing to mm. do that. And you said we have to skip a few bits, but and there is one that I want to go into. We have to skip a few sultans. So I'm yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so sorry, going. but we have to go. I want to start with Abdul. Let's start maybe, but I want to continue on Abdul Hamid the second. And yep. we talked about him in the first episode briefly. That there is, I don't know if it's currently ongoing, but there was a soap opera about him in Turkey, which I I, I kind of enjoy that series actually. But it's, yeah, they, they, you've got to be careful reels. with it. But all the Turkish, all the, there is a whole series. One of the most popular TV shows uh, about 10 years ago was a dramatization of Suleiman the Magnificent and Roxolana. That was popular across the whole of the Middle East and on into places like China and India as well. Um, I've forgotten the name of it. Um, but all of these. The Magnificent are, Century, I think it's called. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Yes. Um, but the thing about these are they are. Um, they're all seen from the point of view of like the Ottomans were great. Yeah. So, you know, there is there is not really much criticism about it or explanation. So I, I think that when, we, you know, seeing we're now in, into his reign, um, I, th I think we need to talk about, you know, uh, if you're OK with it, to sort of like talk about yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Armenians and Islam. Of course, as well. yeah. So basically, when the Ottoman, we, you mentioned at the early on in this, none of the sultans went on the pilgrimage to Mecca. So how Muslim were they really? And that's the thing. The Islam was secondary to the Ottomans when they were in their prime. They were Ottoman first, Muslim second. But towards the end, the argument, because they're now running out of power. So why should anybody listen to the Sultan? And the answer is, I'm Muslim, you're Muslim, we're all Muslim brothers. Look at how Muslims are being treated by the uh, British Empire, by the French Empire. So under the Ottoman Empire, um, our Muslim brothers will be working together fine. So actually, weirdly, um, at the time when people are inventing steam engines and like, you know, telescopes that can spot Pluto and things like that, 
these guys are actually falling back onto the old ways, onto the religious faith as, as a unifying factor. And it kind of works. But obviously, when you're starting to point out the differences, you're othering people. And so we then get to the Armenians who are trying, who are Christian and are trying to break away and become independent. Mm. And so if when Armenia was captured originally by the Ottoman Empire, there weren't lots of massacres. There, there, you know, they were incorporated the same way as Greece was or Hungary was. Um, but because you've got this breakdown of central authority, they basically the Ottomans descended into, well, you know, if they're causing trouble, let's get them. And, you know, uh, Abdul Hamid was at, was at the, um, you know, there were some Armenians who tried to kill him. Um, and at the first National Ottoman Bank, uh, there was a very bloody bank robbery carried out by Armenian freedom fighters. So these people weren't without agency. They, they weren't just sitting there waiting to be attacked by the Ottomans. They were pushing back. And when you push back mm. against a desperate empire, that desperate empire is going to do something horrific. And that's what happens next. Now, as we, I we've been kind of praising the Ottomans up to this point, but then, like, and like you said, we're going to take a look, especially during World War One as well, we're going to take a look at this, and that they weren't all good, were they? Well, absolutely not. The, 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 yeah, so I, I think with the Armenians, um, that part of the book I rewrote 11 times. This book got uh, review bombed initially by Turkish, with by people with Turkish names. They didn't like it. Mm. However, I know that, that there are some Armenians going, you you haven't sort of compared it to the Holocaust. And it's like, because it wasn't the Holocaust, that, you know, things don't have to be terrible and the Holocaust. They can be just terrible in their own way. Yes. But, it, it, but, but the important thing here is it's complicated. The Armenians ended up getting supplied by the Russians. When the Armenians started uh, pushing back and getting into Islamic, uh, villages, they carried out massacres. They carried out massacres they, because they themselves had been massacred. But this, so there, it wasn't just this side's bad, this side's good. The other thing is, as I've already said, there's no such thing as a Turk. So who was doing all of this? Most of the deaths of the Armenians was in uh, basically in the deserts of Syria. So do we blame the Syrians for that? A lot of the soldiers involved were Kurds. So do we blame the Kurds for that? So it gets complicated, but the modern Republic of Turkey doesn't even want to talk about it, which is wrong. I'm aware that in some countries it is illegal to call what happened to the Armenians a genocide. And I know that in other countries it's illegal to not call it a genocide. So the point is, there's no doubt that at least a million, possibly two million Armenians died unnecessarily yeah, that's through you disease and call starvation. It genocide. Yeah, but the point is, was it deliberate? As I point out, this is at a time when the Ottoman Empire is collapsing. They sent 50,000 soldiers to fight in the Caucasus without winter clothing, and none of those soldiers made it to the front line. Now, they weren't trying to kill their own troops, but it shows you how incompetent they were. By the mm. Once we get into World War I, we're getting to the situation of soldiers having to share rifles, not enough boots to go around. This is a society that I don't believe could have organized a genocide, but it's a genocide through incompetence, through the fact that they just didn't know what to do with these people or were just so angry with them. It's just like, just kill them and we're worried about it afterwards. But I don't believe, and there has been no evidence of an official order saying, you know, uh, anything like the sort of the, the German final solution. There is no Ottoman equivalent of that. But that doesn't stop the fact that, uh, you know, over a million Armenians, a vast majority of those civilians were killed, which is mm. absolutely a war crime. So this is what I'm trying to do as a juggling act. I guarantee that a Turk would find everything I'm saying unacceptable. And I guarantee an Armenian would say that I'm being, I'm couching this in too many sort of friendly terms. Mm. But again, I'm going to the facts here rather than what's going yeah. on. But but like I say, what's telling is that there weren't massacres of Armenians in, let's say, the 1600s because everybody was under control then. Uh, you know, when when the system worked, it was actually everybody just got on with it. It's when the when it when it became frail and vulnerable, people started taking advantage. And sometimes the authorities pushed back way too hard. But on other times, these these local areas got away with it. Mm. And so by the time we get to World War One, the reason why the Ottomans come onto the German side is because the Germans were basically the only empire that hadn't been picking away at bits of the Ottoman mm. Empire.
Um, so, and and of course, they're they're. So England was like, it. I'm gonna take this bit of France. I'm gonna take him this over here. Yes. Now, and technically, you've got Mehmet V, who was the Sultan during World War One. But the reality was by then, and it's like I say, it's only at the very end of the Ottoman Empire you get something called the Three Pashas. These, so basically, these three men carry out a palace coup and they run the Ottoman Empire. And at that point, the sultans, for the first time, are figureheads. They're not coming up with actual policy. Basically, Mehmet V is just sitting in his palace sipping tea while these three guys are trying to run a world war and doing it pretty badly. It wasn't all designed. I mean, the, perhaps the most famous battle is the is Gallipoli, where the Ottomans defeated a combined British imperial and French operation uh, you know so that's that was uh, and also in iraq when the british tried to sort of push in there they got surrounded and had to surrender on mass at a place called kut uh, there were three battles of gaza so the 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 ottomans again if they were as sick as everybody said they were they should have collapsed in the first year in the end they fought you know into 1918 but at that point that you know, if if Germany and industrialized Germany couldn't beat the Allies, what chance did the Ottoman Empire have? There's something we have to do though. Before I'd go back and we talked about World War Two one briefly, and that is an ep entire episode in itself on the, from the Ottoman side. But we have to something to, we can't skip the past is uh, the cup and the the, the dissolvement of Abdullah II, uh, who would be the last official sultan and before they became kind of constitutional monarchy and we have to talk, talk i feel like we have to mention the cup what was the cup and how did it come so, about it, 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 yeah, yeah uh, just uh, in english pronunciation coup uh, is, is how you say it so i just said just, just, like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how i read it <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's the problem with English, isn't it? It's, you know, oh, it's such an awkward language. I, I complained about Ottoman Turkish. English is just as bad. So, yeah. So, yeah, the thing about that. Yeah. So um, it's in the late 1800s that really the sultans are being pushed to one side, that you've got these sort of military men who are who recognize the, the, the Osman family is a liability. They are trying. We've talked about how they reform the army, no more janissaries and sort of some some attempts at industrialization. But what's but if you like, it doesn't matter who's in charge. The Ottoman Empire just doesn't work by by the by the end of the 1800s. You know, you've got all these countries that want their independence. We've got, um, you know, we've got all these pressures from like Russia and, you know, the whole of the West is sort of now done with them. The irony is that if they managed to hang on maybe another 10 years, if they didn't get involved in World War One, remain neutral and lived, uh, you know, survived into the 1930s, they would have found oil in, in Saudi Arabia, which would have been still part of the uh, Ottoman Empire. And they might then have been able to revitalize themselves. But that's counterfactual. That's not what happened. They tried to get involved into the, the power playing of, of bigger, more uh, vibrant empires, and it crushed the Ottoman Empire uh, in the end. Um, but yeah, so nobody could have fixed the Ottoman Empire at the end, but the coups were trying to at least change the, the politics. And again, there was more attempts at trying to give some power to like a parliament sort of system. And just before World War I, it is worth pointing out that there was the two Balkan Wars where um, uh, the Ottomans uh, managed to hang on. It was, it was basically World War I in the Balkans. Uh, you have modern day artillery and, and everything else. Very, very briefly, they even lost Erdene, but um, they managed to get it back in the Second Balkan War. Um, so you, at that point, you got places like Serbia and uh, Greece and uh, Bulgaria all trying to fight the Ottoman Empire, and they didn't collapse. So it does show you that they, there was still fire in the belly, but they were just so far behind with so many different parts of the empire wanting to go their separate way. It, you know, it's a bit like Britain with the British Empire. The, the basic agreement with India was like, stay with us for World War II. You get your independence after World War II. And they did that. You know, the British Empire just quietly dismantled itself, by and large, in the second half of the 20th century. Whereas the Ottoman Empire just wanted to pretend that they could still hold on to this stuff. And so many people died because of that. Someone, someone have to mention, of course, at the end of the Ottoman world is, is Mustafa Kemal. Yeah. So where does he come in the picture? Because he seemed, I read the, a while ago again a book by Jerry Mango who wrote about yes. Mustafa Kemal, that, which is brilliant. 
Absolutely. And, Very uh, much the definitive work. I would, I mean, it's so good. It's so in depth. I'm going to say you really have to know your Ottoman history to mm. get the most out of that book. But it, yeah, I mean, if you want to know everything about Mustafa Kemal, that's the place to go. Ataturk by uh, Mango. Yeah. And uh, with Mero, he does seem to be friends with the Sultan. It's fascinating how he starts out as a friend of the Sultan before going on to become. I would hesitate in calling him an enemy, but, you know, because before I go against him. Well, he was an Ottoman officer, of course. You know, th this was a man who who fought in North Africa against the Italians. And this is also a man who fought in in World War One in Gallipoli. So, you know, he had he could see all the flaws of, of the empire, but he could also see how aggressive the West was being as well. So that when everything collapses in a complete mess in the 1920s, you can understand why he says, you know, there had never been a country called the Republic of Turkey ever before in history. It's a made up country. And so he had to do his best to defend its borders. And the first thing that happens is Greece invades and Greece invades with you know the the backing of all the Western powers and you know, it is brilliant general though ab, you know with almost nothing with an exhausted army with a completely new country he manages to defeat a really well supplied Greek army now the Greeks again were playing to the West's view of the of past of history the Greeks were trying to rebuild the Byzantine Empire but they knew that wouldn't play well with the West so instead they were talking about how. Western Anatolia used to be part of ancient Greece. And don't you remember the times of Themistocles? And this played very well to like, you know, somewhere, someone in Oxford University who'd been reading Greek and Latin for a degree. But the reality is that that's not what the modern reality was going on in those areas. I believe and it was yes, Mustafa so Kemal who said something like, as an order you to die and to stand up and die and not retreat, something in, in, the, li in the line of that. I think it's exaggerated. It's some. It is mentioned yes. that he did say something along that line. Ab absolutely. Look, uh, the, the again, sort of like the uh, the, the Greco-Turkish Turkish War of the 1920s. Basically, what happened was Greece landed in Anatolia and they kept pushing further and further in. But uh, uh, but Ataturk, I'm just that's what I'm going to call him now. He recognized that the further he retreats, the more um, vulnerable the supply lines and logistics back to logistics again of the Greeks would be. And so they end up having this this battle in roughly the middle of of uh, Anatolia in the kind of the middle of nowhere. That's the point. The Greeks were so far away from their supply depots that the Turks managed to stop them, surround them to start destroying all their heavy artillery and stuff like that and the greeks then had to just do a mad dash to the to the um to the coast what happened to show you the link between a ataturk and the old ottoman ways is his house where he was born which is a very important to modern day turkey is in modern day greece it is constantly mm. guarded by the Greeks. They do not want anything bad to happen to that because that would probably start a war with Turkey. Um, so, yeah, so, um, you know, he was born in what is now called Greece. He in no way considered himself Greek. Um, and yet he also sort of created this whole new nation. The other thing is that the, the people who thought of themselves as ethnically Turkish in Greece moved to Turkey and the people who thought of themselves as ethnically Greek moved to, to Greece. So... This is absolutely ethnic cleansing and more Greeks were forced to leave Anatolia than the other way around. But, you know, that that's what happened. And when you look at the bloodshed of like the Russian Revolution, French Revolution, American Revolution, the revolution to create uh, Ottoman Turkey was relatively bloodless. And, and as soon as the war was finished, he never fought again. This is a man who'd spent his entire life being a military general. If you want an example of a benevolent dictator, Ataturk's an example. He genuinely had the best interest of the country at heart. He was a dictator, but he wasn't trying to, um, when you look at all the other despots in the Middle East, he wasn't trying to make himself now, rich. Sir, he did quite, was quite genuine as well, I would argue, argue that he was. Yeah, yeah. Genuine, I mean, genuine there are leader. a few benevolent dictators. I would also argue Charles II of England as well. But, but anyway, yeah. So he is, and I think that, and I mentioned this in the book, he dies uh, basically in 1938, but he could see that storm clouds were coming to Europe and he basically made all of his government promise that, that, that there was likely to be another world war and to not get involved. And indeed, mm. Turkey was neutral in uh, World War II up until I think it was about 
a month before the end of the European campaign when they finally declared war in Germany. But let's face it, you know, if we are in April 1945, you know who's going to win by yeah. then. Um, but but I, I think say the they... Germans. <laughs> yes. Again, apologies to Norway. You you had it rough uh, for the whole for the whole war, but yeah. So that takes you. All, so, but what's insane is there are still a few old people today that were born Ottoman subjects, and yet the birth of the Ottoman Empire happened at the time when the Crusades were going on in in Europe. So that shows you the amazing stretch of time that the Ottoman Empire covered, and how it couldn't possibly survive any longer than it actually did. We, we spoke about this in our episode on the Ottoman army with the, and, the, and let's see, Mesut Uyar is his name. And uh, he wrote a book about an Ottoman army as well. But we talked about this, how the Ottomans really was the last Mediterranean empire in history. And you have to respect them. That the, and We talked about this in the first part as well, that they had one dynasty that they didn't like, not like the Julio Claudian dynasty or ancient Roman, they switched dynasties all the time, or Byzantine Empire, where that happened as well. And they just had one dynasty for 600 years. And you have to respect them for that. They, and this family is still alive today. They're, Absolutely, they're still yes. descendants. They didn't execute them when Mustafa Kemal came to power he didn't execute the entire family and just sent them to exile and they're still living they as descendants of the house of osman absolutely yes so you know the history continues the history lives on thank you so much for coming on this has been a, i hope you enjoyed this two part of the ottoman empire we are definitely making more about the ottomans in the future so stay tuned for that Please, th thank you so much for coming on the podcast twice. I have, do you have, where, where can people buy your book if they should be interested? Do you have anything else you wish to promote and in social media where people might find you? I'm at Jem Daduccio on Twitter. You feel free to say hi. Uh, the Sultan's book is published through Amberley. It's available anywhere you want to get books. Um, it's now available in softback. Uh, and also I have my own podcast called Condensed Histories, available wherever you get podcasts. And that's sort of my historical stuff. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been Well That Aged Well. I hope you liked this episode. If you did, please check out some other episodes of our podcast. We definitely got something that you should like here. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you're an Apple podcast, please consider leaving a review. That would help us out a lot. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts. And again, please like, share, and subscribe. I'll see you next time.